Today you've joined hundreds of established and emerging writers who are discovering ways to reach their writing goals and have fun by being more curious, creative, and productive. You're listening to Ann Croker, Writing Coach. This is episode 208. First-time children's book author Sharon Stoller, her path to self-publishing. Today I'm chatting with Sharon Stoller, author of the nonfiction children's book Affectionately Yours, The Devoted Life of Abigail Adams, a charming and inspiring picture book released in June 2019. Sharon Stoller has a B.S. in early childhood education from the University of Delaware and a Master's of Education from Westchester University. She's taught children ages 4 through 12 in private, public, and homeschool classrooms. She currently teaches third grade in a hybrid homeschool classroom and often finds herself delighted by her students and their brilliant minds. Aside from her own family room, she feels most at home in a library. She and her adventurous husband live in Indianapolis, where they cater to the needs of their Siamese cat, Gigi. They have three grown children. As you'll learn in the interview, Sharon and I met years ago when we both started home educating our very small children, so we've known each other for decades. I was privy to her idea for this book years ago when she shared it with me as a friend. Later, we worked together when she brought me on for more official coaching. Sharon's path to publishing was long and required vision, flexibility, patience, and perseverance. Pursuing traditional publishing revealed insights that led her to eventually land on self-publishing affectionately yours. And anyone who spoke around at self-publishing or pulled it off knows that to do it well, you undertake a long list of new steps and stages. She did it. She pulled it off. And I hope you find her story inspiring. Though the process was long and complicated, time-consuming and expensive, she said that the moment she held that book in her hands, it was all worth it. Meet children's book author, Sharon Stoller. Sharon, it is so great to have you on, and I'm really glad that we're going to have this conversation about your work. Welcome. Thank you so much, Anne. It's just a pleasure to be here and such an honor that you asked me to join you. Oh, golly. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you could work it out. So what I would love for you to do is for the people who don't know you, tell us a little bit about who you are, and then I'll explain a little bit more why I brought you on. But tell, tell people who you are, what you've done in life, and how that led up to your work as an author. Um, well, I'll go way back to where I was born, Pennsylvania, and uh, my dad was a history teacher. And so... He instilled a love for history, and uh, he's also a voracious reader, and so a love for books and all things historical. Our family vacations would be to Philadelphia and Gettysburg and Williamsburg, and we survived the reenactment of the bicentennial years. So all of those things were in me and um, got me to the place of what a genre I wanted to write about. Um, But I went to college, I became a teacher, I worked for a public school first grade, and I loved those years. Um, I feel like I was very alive during that time. Uh, And I think that the idea for a picture book came in college when uh, Dr. Pikulski would start each education class reading a children's book, a picture book out loud. And uh, I just was so intrigued that a college professor would take the time to do that. And I realized, wow, reading aloud must be really important. And so um, all of those things coupled together planted the seed of writing my own children's book. That's a perfect, seems like a perfect background for a children's book author. And so you and I go way back ourselves, not as far back as college, but we go back to some, our our era of raising our kids. So we experienced a little bit of that, um, the joy of reading aloud to our kids. We experienced some of that, you and I together. And so listeners probably will appreciate that, you know, you are a personal friend. And so you know, this 
this process I got to see in a unique way. And um, so it's been a real joy to watch this process and um, that I thought that they might like to hear a little bit more about not only this background of what you're coming from, but just the process of creating a book because you ended up self-publishing. Tell us a little bit about then. So you had this planted the seed of wanting to be a children's book author, but then you actually had the seed of this particular book. Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, well, during those years when I first met you, I read the John Adams biography by David McCullough. And I just fell in love with their love story and how they were able to remain connected across the miles and so many years of separation. And I was so intrigued by Abigail being so strong and um, had such, she had such tenacity and I thought, man, I don't know if I could be apart from my husband all those years and raising the kids without him and um, taking care of a farm. And, and then being outspoken with her voice to her husband in a time when women didn't do that. Uh, so all of those things um, led me to really love Abigail, um, be intrigued by her, and I wanted to learn more about her. But also, um, I like to be real. I am not a game player. I, I like real conversations with real people. And so I thought I should not write a fantasy book. I should not write a fiction book. If I want to write a children's book, it should be a real book about a real person. And so that's kind of how Abigail was first in me. So, okay. So then did you come upon and say the name of the book, the full name of the book, and then tell us a little bit about how you happened upon the title. So the title is Affectionately Yours, The Devoted Life of Abigail Adams. And the hook for the book is the letters that they wrote to each other. And I wanted to include real excerpts of their actual letters that are in an archive online, easy to find. Uh, and then I just modify those to make them readable for, for children. Um, and a lot of the times Abigail would sign her letters affectionately yours. And so that's how the title came about. And then the subtitle I toyed around with a little bit, but um, she really was devoted to her husband. They were devoted to each other. They um, loved each other till the very end through thick and thin, through all those years of being apart and him being in foreign countries. And um, they stayed connected. And so. I, I wanted to highlight that as part of the title. That's really beautiful. Yeah, you've pulled from her own words for the main title. You've highlighted this character trait that you observed in that original John Adams biography and then through the letters and through your own research into her. So what category of a book is this other than a picture book? Do they actually have a subcategory of nonfiction children's picture books? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it, is this historical fiction or is this nonfiction? It is nonfiction. It's a picture book biography. And so how, how, um, how do you sense the level of expectation is from publishers? How strict are they to sticking with the history of it? Does that make sense? Um, how accurate do you need to be as a children's uh -huh. book author? Exceptionally accurate, as accurate as possible. Uh, to be to be categorized as a picture book biography. Did you find that a challenge? Was it hard? Or did you have plenty of resources? There were because of the letters being available, um, that really helped to have those primary source documents available to me. And um, I could stick to that. Although there were little funny things that happened, uh, such as 
Darren somehow, Darren the illustrator, Darren Benson, uh, somehow had in his mind that Abigail was left-handed. And so he drew her that way. And because the book is all about writing letters, uh, this is a really important detail. And somehow we came upon the idea that maybe she might not be left-handed. And uh, of course, went back to the letters and it was pretty clear she was right-handed, so. How did you figure that out? <laughs> Um, well, it was, it only took a couple minutes of research. It was written in one of her letters that her finger on her right hand was sore. And so that's why she had a delay in writing to him. And then I also double checked with the Smithsonian Institute and they did confirm. She's right handed. So you had to do some research just even toward the later stages of the development of this book, right? Yes. Yeah. Wow. I went back to the letters quite a bit. That's really great. That's a way of honoring the main character of your book by trying to stay as true and pure to what was reality as possible. And then you're bringing that then to the child reader and any adult reader who happens to be involved in reading that with the child. Exactly. Kids will get really caught up in uh, a certain detail that you might not expect. And so you you want to make sure you're revealing the truth to them. Especially something like a, a left-handed person. If you had a left-handed child who saw that she was left-handed, they would probably notice because they already have identified that they're in the, maybe in the minority. And so, oh, she was left-handed like me. And then, oops, <laughs> really, not really. Um, so let's back up now in the timeline because we're already talking about a published book right now and I love hearing about Affectionately Yours and all the details, but I would love to back up early, early in that process and talk about it from the perspective of a, a writer. So Affectionately Yours is, how would you describe it? Is it indie published, independently published or self-published? What? How would you describe how it ended up being published? Uh, well, it started out with the idea of being self-published. And uh, on my first meeting with Darren, he throws out this idea, hey, I always wanted to have a publishing arm to my, uh, my story business, uh, storytelling business, he calls it, uh, which is his, his personal business. Uh, and I was thrilled to hear that. Um, I didn't really know what that meant. And so um, I I'd kind of say that it's a hybrid. Not technically self-published, not technically a true publisher. So, so Darren, again, is your illustrator, Darren Benson. So he has a, a business that is he you're maybe his first experiment in publishing a book from beginning to end on his part but he is also the illustrator so he kind of in a way as had became the publisher and took some of the elements away from you that you would have had to figure out on your own exactly exactly yes i am the guinea pig so but backing way up like way back to the beginning when you have the initial idea do you mind walking through it might even you know bring back bad memories or something, going all the way to the beginning. Um, we, I'm sure that there are a lot of people listening who, if they, they're either interested in writing children's books or they're curious about like this pathway that you've taken, even if they're writing in a different kind of genre for adults. But like going back to the beginning, you had the idea, then you wrote it, like, right? You, you wrote a draft and then tell me like what were some of those very first steps you took? Well, and this was long ago, so it was back in the day of going to the library, checking out a bunch of books, bringing them home, taking handwritten notes. Uh, so that's how long ago the idea was birthed. <laughs> that's so uh, funny. That seems, it does seem I, like I the dark ages, but it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> I know, I know, but it was almost stick and sand. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's too bad I didn't save all those scrawled notes, but that is how it began. 
And that's kind of the way I was taught. And so it seemed natural to me. And I pulled something together. I think we connected one time and you were very helpful editing and um, giving me lots of advice just as a friend before you had any of your businesses going. And right. I, I, was, I had been a writer and an editor, but I hadn't been a coach. So this was just informally connecting with you many years ago. Yeah, I can't remember the years. You don't have to throw it out to make us feel old, but um, I don't even remember it being exactly when it was. Yeah, it was way back. So, okay, so you have a draft, you brought in somebody, would you say that was a key move for you to pull somebody in? And did you choose the right person? <laughs> I'm not trying to put, I'm not looking for a compliment. I'm really not. But like, what kind of a person should you bring in or have brought in? And what would you recommend to people? Yes, absolutely. You were the right person. But I'll talk a little bit about that after I give you the interlude. So I had the draft. I was excited about it. I think I may have even sent it to a couple of publishers. But at that point, I was so naive. There were so many things that I did not know about the publishing world, about being an author. And obviously, things change uh, quickly. Um, so it was a good thing that that I put it on the shelf. And the reason that that happened was because we adopted a child. And that was very challenging. The, almost every avenue of life was a difficulty with him. Um, so affectionately yours got put away in the safe for a long time. So that all those handwritten pages wouldn't burn up in a fire and like literally put it in a safe i literally did and i had you know electronic copies but within those years everything changes and that was lost which we found out about later so fast forward many years and i met a, a gal and she said hey, I wrote a children's book. I wondered if you'd look at it. You're a teacher. And I said, I did too. And she said, well, let's get together. She's very enthusiastic. Let's get together. Let's read each other's manuscripts and let's see how we can help each other, what we can do to work together. And so that's what kind of brought it back up again. And I had lots of people involved in helping me, but I, of course, had your help. Uh, and at that point, I had your help in many ways. Um, I did not know how to write a book proposal. So I think that was maybe one of the first things that we did together. And then um, you did editing as well. Uh, and that, I mean, you can't, you cannot do this without the work of Ann Croker. So everybody, you need to know <laughs> Ann Croker. <laughs> He's phenomenal, enthusiastic, and so very helpful. Thank you. But um, I think the idea here is that as, as, a, as someone who is preparing, at this point you're preparing for traditional publishing is what your thought was, right? Yeah. So you were pulling in somebody who could give you some publishing advice, yes? And, yeah. and actually help you with the manuscript, preparing it for submission to agents or publishers. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So, so whether that's a coach or, or just somebody else who's further down the line and maybe can mentor you, there are multiple roles maybe that could fill, you could fill that with a person, me or somebody else. Yeah, there are groups, uh, Facebook groups, a couple really great groups I joined. One was called WOW Nonfiction Picture Books. And, and then the children's author and illustrator Facebook group, those people are incredible. And that's a, um, a self-publishing group. And so I can share more about that later. But I wanted to also mention that uh, you also helped me rewrite at one point. So I had been testing the waters, uh, sending out manuscripts to publishers. And one of them asked me if I would do a rewrite. 
And so that's when I ask you, can you help me to give them what they want? And uh, that was, even though it ended up in a rejection, that was a real turning point because the, the book became less of a, a collection of historical blurbs and more of a story. And it told the tale in a, in a way that was more appropriate for young children. I remember being like at a soccer match in the parking lot, talking to you on the phone or something about the, the revisions. And I can't remember if it was before or we were reviewing them. But the point is that you were willing to change. And that is hard when you have an initial idea and then you're being asked to change your precious creation. You were flexible enough to do that. And so you would say, I think what I'm hearing you say, is it's a better book because of that? Absolutely. I tried to take people's advice, whether it was yours or that particular editor or Darren's advice. I, I don't know everything. There are many, many things that I don't know. And, and that became abundantly clear in this process. So I was happy for any professional advice that I could that I could muster or just advice from people who've already been down the way so so yeah you're you're absorbing this advice and it's creating little shifts and pivots in your life um so we've gotten up to now there's been so you've submitted to how many agents or publishers would you have say you submitted to you said a couple maybe like two oh no no many more um I, I use picture book biographies in my classroom. And so I would pick the ones that I really loved the most and I would look who published them. And then I would go and research that particular company because I knew that they published my type of genre. And then I had to find out, well, whether or not they accepted manuscripts without an agent. And so um, that that was a, an initial process of getting me to figure out which ones to send out to. And it turned out to be probably at least 10, maybe more. So then the process becomes longer and longer as you're waiting to hear. And um, I, I was respectful of their guidelines. And I waited the amount of time that they suggested and I didn't badger them or bother them um, so it just became a very long process two years at least and then you had some really great contacts for me and when those didn't work out I thought okay do I want this to happen or do I just want to put it aside and say hey I, I wrote a book even though it's, it's not going to be seen by anyone. And I decided, nope, I'm going to do it. And that is the point in which I decided, okay, I need an illustrator. That is a big moment because I think a lot of people ask that question and they're like, if it's being rejected by everybody, maybe it doesn't deserve to be published and they just shelve it. And I think that they are underestimating how much publishers are being bombarded with projects. They can't do even excellent projects or it just got into the slush pile and they never saw it or who knows, who knows? Uh, or they just published a book kind of like that and so they didn't want to do another one. So you could have an excellent product, an excellent book, an excellent biography or whatever and receive rejections, multiple rejections over the course of two years and still have a book that you know has worth and deserves to be in the hands of readers. And I really, I'm impressed. That takes a lot of vision and grit to set to, and confidence. You've somehow found inside of you enough confidence to sort of self-validate this book. And that is very rare. I don't see that in a lot of people. It's easier to say, oh, it, it must stink and I'll give up. So a quick question about that would be, what, how did you find that? What, uh, 
what helped you look at it and say, no, I'm going to do it? Um, well, thank you, Anne. I appreciate you saying that. I think the the time of the rewrite, the feedback that I was getting from that particular editor was really good feedback. And I felt like that gave me some confidence. And then I tested out the book on some young readers. I brought it to my classroom without any illustrations and I just tested it out to see what they thought. And then I asked them questions. What did you like best about the book? What, what were your favorite parts? How did you connect with the characters and all of that? And of course, at eight and nine years old, they still love their teacher and they want to please, but the reviews were positive. So uh, spurred me on. That is great. So you ba basically, and we might say beta tested it with beta readers who were young readers and you had the advantage of having a classroom. Not everybody is going to have that, but they could still like surely they know somebody who could be in a group like a big family or maybe there'd be a collection of parents getting together for a play day or you could pull one together in someone's home you could recreate this experience i think with a children's book and get that and then you could see where they are they getting bored what are they responding to most where did they get confused and did, did you make any changes after that to the content um i i did i not the actual story, but the end matter. Um, I learned along the way that um, uh, one of those things that I didn't know in the very beginning was that a picture book has a standard size of page and page number. And so uh, mine was way longer because I wanted it to be a tool for teachers as well. And so I included a lot of activities and uh, at that point, I real when I realized that it had to be exactly 32 pages, uh, then I started pulling things. And so the, and I think you were the one that suggested, let's put the activities on the website. And yes. So. And that is something that people can sign up maybe for and get, um, or do they need to buy the book to get the end matter or to get this teacher's tips? The, the teacher's guide is available right now if you purchase the book. Uh, so it's, it, it goes along with the story and there are many activities. There is a, a, a list of other books that you could use if you were doing a, a unit study on um, the Revolutionary War, colonial time period. Um, and that was what I most wanted to share with teachers. And so um, I'm not sure what my plans will be in the future for that, but right now it's available with the book. That's fabulous. So basically you've got this picture book that's a standalone product for a child to purchase and read or the parent to purchase for the child and then read to the child. Or, um, but then you've also got a tool that a parent could learn more and, and teach a little bit their kid just on their own. A homeschool parent could really get into it and create a whole unit study. And then a teacher could use it in the classroom if as part of a bigger curriculum with maybe ideas they never thought of that they could do that specific to that book or beyond. Is that what you're saying? That's right. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's an advantage you have as being a classroom teacher as well <laughs> as a home educator in the past is that you have this, you know, what works with kids and, and you could test the material again. And that's what you that's what brought us to this. You were saying those kids, there were some things you tried with them activities. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So we're kind of jumping back and forth like this is a great marketing tool for a published book, but you discovered it in the beta testing. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to that beta testing era. You you realized I have a book worth publishing and you had said that's when you brought in Darren. So again, let's review. Darren Benson is your illustrator. Did, how did you find Darren? Well, that difficult child that I adopted was not only challenging at home, he was difficult at school and at church and basically all the places he went. Uh, and Darren, the saint, was his small group leader. And he would act up in church. And so Darren would pull him aside and 
occupy him with his art. And so he would come home with these little drawings done by Darren. And so I knew that he was a good artist and I knew that I liked his art. And um, we were we were family friends, but um, the reason that I went with Darren and there were other people who rose up and were interested in helping me. And I, you can go on fiverr.com and find uh, illustrators that say things like kitty print your book and things like that for $5 a page. And I, I was not really, I, I thought, oh no, that's not gonna work for me. Um, but what I knew about Darren was that he was a solid man of character. And I knew that we could work together and working with friends is not always easy. And sometimes it gets tricky to say the hard things. Uh, but I knew that Darren was a person that I could, I could work with. So that's how I approached him. So yeah, so tell me now just if you, you feel free to summarize the, you know, all the nitty gritty you don't have to get into necessarily, but what happened then? Uh, I gave Darren a dummy copy and we... What's a dummy copy, people who don't know? And you already mentioned kind of the 32 pages thing. Maybe explain a little bit about children's books this so they understand what you're talking about. Uh, well, there are wonderful people online who have given us lovely graphics that show you the exact pages and how they work. So the end pages that are glued actually count. And then it shows you the spreads and how that all goes together to make the 32 pages. And so I actually um, used construction paper and cut out the manuscript and pasted it. And we talked about some ideas that I had and um, the style that I kind of liked. And, and then we had in the contract, we had set up different uh, deadlines and that we would meet. And so you were the project manager, so to speak, like you had said, I would really like to meet these deadlines if possible, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. And the, for someone who's the author only, they only would put the text on there because they're about to work with an illustrator. You wouldn't necessarily have to draw any drawings on there of what you imagine on those pages. You could just, you're just showing them, here's the, the, the piece of the story that's going on this page, or this one's going across two pages or something, you know, that kind of thing, right? Yes. My, my, my pages were blank other than text. And and if you were going with a traditional publisher, and you may know more than I do at this point, but my understanding is that you seeking a traditional publication wouldn't necessarily have to come with an illustrator because the, tr the publisher themselves often have a, a collection of illustrators they really like working with, and they would just assign the one they feel like, kind of like what you did. You had multiple illustrators, and you picked the one you felt like was the best fit for this story. And of course, you picked the person who was like the the one you particularly enjoyed working with. Not that you wouldn't have enjoyed the others as well. Um, same thing, they have these illustrators they enjoy working with and match up with the authors. Is that right? That is correct. So because you are you were heading down the path of self-publishing at this point, so you were project managing, making your deadlines, and choosing your own illustrator. So you pulled that person in. You would not have to bring that to a traditional publisher. Okay. Just making sure listeners know the difference and the possibilities that you could just come with just the text for traditional publishing. But if you're doing it yourself and it's going to be a picture book, you have to have an illustrator. So you've got your deadlines, you've got your contract, you've got your illustrator. What happens next? The left-handed, right-handed Abigail came up, delaying the process quite a bit. There were other things along the way. Um, Darren. I, I trusted his judgment because of the work that he does in his nine to five job and in his own business. Um, he had things that he was really interested in. He was particular about the weight of the paper and the color of the end pages. And um, one of the things that delayed the process a bit was he 
really wanted to use a, a particular font that was more colonial style, but that font was not released for public use um, until a number of months later. Uh, so that delayed the process. And, and then um, he, as the publisher then, he worked with someone to do layout that he knew. So he hired out that person. And that seemed to take quite a bit of time as well. How did you feel about that delay? Is that, did you just accept that as reality? Because I know there's delays in traditional publishing too. You're just not always aware of what the delay is. Well, when you're you're working on a project that you haven't done before, some good things rise up in you and some not so good things. That's honest. Yeah. One of the good things was that I learned to be more bold with um, communicating. One of the not so good things was that I discovered how impatient I am. And Darren is an exceptionally patient person, and um, we had different ideas of timeline and how that would all work together. But um, I, I was relaxed, and then I would get this surge of immediacy, I need this to be done, and then I would lag back again and be comfortable about it. And so um, on those surges, I would speak up with him and say, I honestly need to ask you, when is when can we land this plane? Um, so we had several of those hard conversations, but um, he's such a kind man that I would be all riled up and then I would talk to him on the phone and, and he would just be so sweet and kind and I would get off the phone and go, ah, he's just, so great, I can't be upset with him. So then I then I would see the impatience just, you know, flowing out of me. So um, good things and bad things, but um, yes, it, it went on for quite a bit. And then the printing process also was delayed. I actually have not walked through with anybody other than you, and I didn't really, I wasn't involved in, at all in this part of your process. Um, is it hard to find, um, pick and choose? I, I've seen other people talk about using Lulu or um, Ingram Spark, and, and they might end up with a soft cover book and so on, or a hard cover, depending on what they've chosen. How, who did you pick and, and why? And what's your experience? Uh, yes, a lot of people use those um, Amazon services that you talked about a lot. Uh, uh, and I've noticed that on the Facebook group, the Children's authors and illustrators book uh, authors and illustrators Facebook group that a lot of them go that direction um, because Darren had a connection with a friend who is a printer um, we went with bigger dot and I had seen a lot of their samples and I really liked the matte finish cover and um, it was a quality product I knew up front the the cost and I knew the type of quality I was going to end up with. And I have heard people use, you know, one of the other Amazon related uh, printers and they, uh, they, they find that they're not happy with their product. And I am very happy with my product. Uh, but there were delays. Uh, one of the difficulties was the owner is at the office in the Netherlands. And the company is based out of California and the printing was done in South Korea. And so you're working with all these different time zones and trying to get things accomplished. And there were steps along the way that I was really disappointed with um, for the amount of money that I knew I was gonna end up paying. And so in all those different situations, I had to climb out of my fear and I would go directly to the owner and I would send them an email and say, hey, the final proof that your company sent me had no text on it. And then the second proof that they sent me had text on just the right hand side of the pages. And so, um, and he, 
his feedback to me was always very gracious. And he would say, you know, we can do better. I really appreciate you communicating this to me. I'm going to talk to my team on Monday morning about all of these things that you've mentioned. So uh, it turned out to be a good thing, even though it was a hard thing to work through. And so that those delays are again, are we talking weeks or months? Um, more weeks with the delays of the printing process. Okay. So all this time, you're trying to set a release date, just as a publisher would, uh, working with Darren and his company that is behind it with this hybrid idea. So the hybridness, it sounds the hybridness, is that a word? Um, it, it sounds like it went together, not only in the sense that um, he was taking over, he was only taking over parts of it. So you really were still involved as a project manager, uh, trying to do different pieces of it. How would you say that divvied up? the tasks, the responsibilities? Um, I would put things before him, such as, okay, we need a Library of Congress number. We need an ISBN number. Is that going to be your responsibility or is that going to be my responsibility? Because neither one of us really knew. And so, you know, he would take certain things on, but it was usually me putting them before him. And uh, that's kind of how we divided it up. And all of the marketing I knew would be on my plate. Um, and that's what I was doing when I was in these delays. I was researching. Let's talk about um, the final steps. Like, when did you see like light at the end of the tunnel? It's almost done. It's going to, my book is going to be real. Was it an escalation and you know uh, escalation of activity um, or just more mood and how you're feeling about things anticipation talk about that a little bit um it was a very much a hurry up and wait <laughs> hurry up and wait hurry up and wait and then at the end it did escalate um i i was teaching i was getting texts from darren we need to have one more page and i'm trying to teach and text him at the same time and how fast can you do an illustration and so for all that dummy copy and all that planning at the very very end there was something that we did wrong oh no what was so, it can you say or do you not want to say um it, it had to do with the printer and the the way that they were going to do um certain end pages and in a in a certain color and Darren thought, oh, we should probably just have it more consistent with the rest of the text pages. And so uh, he, he says, I'll have, it, I'll have an illustration by the end of the morning. So he whipped out the very last page, which is kind of a stack of letters, which we had talked about at our original meeting. And we both really loved that idea. And so I'm really thankful that it worked out that way because I love that the kind of quiet close to the book. Um, so that worked out great, but it, it did kind of really speed up because we were working with that timeline backwards. And um, I kept thinking, okay, eight, eight weeks to print, eight weeks to print. So I was very nervous about getting him to that place of let's get there as soon as we can. So what happened next? Is that it? Oh, I, I wish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so advanced copies are supposed to arrive. That, of course, was delayed. There were issues with that. I'm all excited because my boxes are finally here. It's the day I'm going to get to hold my book in my hands. And I open it up. And my husband is really excited about doing a live box reveal and he's filming and um the books were damaged oh no and so yeah it was so disappointing and just burst my bubble so much they sent two separate boxes and they packed them differently and the one survived the treatment of ups and the other one just you could tell exactly the corner that had hit in all of those corners in every book crunched up so 
yeah, that was sad. So that delayed some of the process. And then when the actual shipment was supposed to arrive, um, I started to get nervous because I didn't see my address on the the slip that I had received. And um, as it turns out, you need an appointment to have a um, pallet of books delivered to your house. And so I waited a whole day for my pallet and they didn't have my phone number. And so little things like that happened along the way that um, just made it tricky, but I have my books in my hands now and plenty of them. So now when I order one on amazon.com, do you have to fulfill it? Do yes, you fulfill do. those orders? I do. Okay. So if, if a school orders 75, you pack up 75 and ship them properly <laughs> to that That's school. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that takes us all the way from beginning to end. And you did it. You made a book. You wrote a book. <laughs> you made a book happen. And I'm curious, if you had known what it would take would you have done it? Would you have chosen to do it? It feels pretty good to hold it in my hands. And I, of course, took it to my school. And to hear the feedback from the kids on the first day that I brought it into the classroom, it made it all worth it. One girl just totally nailed it. She said, it's a beautiful book. And I just loved how they were apart, but they really weren't apart. And I said, you got it. So that was just a total joy. That is a beautiful story of how your devotion to Abigail's devotion has come around now and become a reality. And it took your devotion or it wouldn't have happened. So that's an affirmation that going down this path, even though it took you literally years, it's, it's, I'm hearing you say it's worth it. It is worth it. It's so worth it. And if you were to write another book, and it's maybe too soon to say since you just finished one, but if you were to write another one, um, I hope you do, would you tend to now say, now that I've produced this book, let's just say it's a, su a, a huge success, and now you have the opportunity to go to a, a traditional publisher because you know, you did it. They, and they see, wow, she knows how to, to write and sell a children's biography. Would you tend to now try the traditional route or would you simply do it again? Wash, rinse, repeat. Like now you know how to do it. You can do it much more, I assume, much more efficiently. I would definitely try to go the route of the traditional publisher. Um, time and money. This is very expensive. Hiring an illustrator that is a quality illustrator is very expensive. And then the printing is also very expensive. So if you have a lot of money on your hands and a lot of time, then I would suggest go, go the self-publishing route. And if you want to have um, some creative say, I mean, I was able to to speak into a lot of different things with Darren, whereas I would not have been able to do that. And so you just kind of give up that right, but I would be willing to based on cost alone. That's a good, a good point and something people don't anticipate heading into it. And that is why I've heard from publishers say that's why it's hard for them too, because it costs them just as it costs you more because of the color, because of the illustrator, all there's a lot more involved in children's beautiful children's book that everybody will be proud of and every child will be happy to hold in their hands and turn the pages of that's there's a lot more that goes into that than a typical trade nonfiction book that people would pull up like the ones you see on my shelf those are less expensive to make and easier to say yes to mm -hmm. where could people find you if they wanted to go directly to you uh sharonstoller.com is my website and um, you can find the book on Amazon. Affectionately yours, The Devoted Life of Abigail Adams. Is that right? Get the subtitle right? That's right.
All right. And so uh, Stoller is S-T-O-H-L-E-R. Sharon, thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. I appreciate you having me so much. Thank you for joining me for this conversation with author Sharon Stoller. You can find all the resources and links that came up in our chat at annecroker.com slash Sharon. My name's the trickiest part. My last name is spelled K-R-O-E-K-E-R. And I'm Ann Croker cheering you on as a writing coach in your ear. Everywhere we may meet. At my website, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, in your inbox, here on this podcast, over at Patreon, or even in person. I'm always looking for ideas to share with you that will help you achieve your writing goals and have fun by being more curious, creative, and productive. Thank you for listening.